Thanks a lot, David. Thanks a lot for coming today. And I'm really glad to be, have the opportunity to present, present some of my uh, research. Uh, so I'm Bruno Turnheim. I'm uh, in a lab, uh, research lab based in the east of Paris. Uh, so Laboratoire Interdisciplinaire Science, Innovation, Société. Broadly thinking about issues of uh, materiality, techniques, innovation in society. And uh, I'm also a permanent uh, research scientist at INRA. INRA is the French National Institute for Research in Food, Agriculture and Environment. Uh, most of my research I've done, well, in various places in the world, uh, mostly in Europe, in interdisciplinary settings. And eventually I landed in a broad field, a very interdisciplinary field that is called transition studies where the main object of study is phenomena of uh, f deep fundamental change in systems uh, that we are uh, customarily uh, uh, in contact with in society, whether these are mobility systems, health systems, uh, energy systems, food systems, etc. And the, the, the main big question that we ask in transition studies is how do these large systems that tend to be very stable, very inert, locked in, how do they nonetheless change over time? This change is rare, very difficult, very political, involves changes in multiple uh, dimensions of society, knowledge production, rules, uh, material things, jobs, uh, geography, territorial governance, uh, and yeah, and again, they are very rare. Nonetheless, they happen. A lot of the evidence in that research field is about his well, historical cases, and I'm going to present a historical case today. But of course, uh, in the context of uh, addressing uh, societal issues such as climate change, social justice, uh, uh, deep concerns with uh, economic structures. This thinking about transitions is becoming increasingly relevant, uh, not only as a research uh, issue, but also as a policy practice issue. Voila. So I'm going to now also, uh, I'm going to give a quick introduction of transitions and how we look at the world from a socio-technical perspective. Uh, and then I'm going to focus on one mechanism of change, namely how existing things die are phased out or are confronted with the possibility of their death. And I'll focus on a, I'll illustrate this with a, a case from uh, the historical phase out of electric trams in France. So electric trams, specifically in large cities, were prevalent mode of public transportation uh, in the early 1900s. And uh, systematically, they've been phased out uh, in uh, various uh, Western cities during the 20th century. Tout va bien? Tout va bien. Alors, attends, il y a plusieurs trucs qui se passent en même temps. Ah, vous voyez mes emails aussi. OK. Uh, voilà. So quickly, the program today, a quick introduction on the field, on the object of transitions and socio-technical systems, their change. Then I'll introduce the problem of destabilization and phase out. Uh, then I'll propose a way to analyze destabilization as a process. Then I'll illustrate this in uh, the case of electric trams in France and their dismantling. And then I'll provide a number of, of further uh, illustrations really quickly uh, so that you can see how this phen phenomenon can play out in different settings and then conclude. Most of the work I'm going to be talking about here has been uh, published uh, in these uh, various books and articles. So uh, if you want to learn about transitions and uh, specifically a socio-technical look at transitions, please uh, have a look at this first uh, uh, book, The Great Reconfiguration, where we go over system transformations in the UK, in mobility, in energy and in heating. Uh, then technologies and decline is an edited, they're all open access now, by the way. 
uh, Technologies in Decline is a book, an edited volume where we invited a number of colleagues to sort of uh, contribute various perspectives on technology decline, destabilization, discontinuation. There's empirical examples, there's policy examples, practice examples uh, from different uh, substrands and disciplines. And the last paper uh, um, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, the US, uh, a very generalist uh, uh, journal, uh, where I developed this case of the, of the tram, at least an overview of it. So transitions, what's a transition? What, you know, how would we look at it? I mean, it, I think it's, it's blatant to see that this has become a keyword in society. We hear transition talk pretty much everywhere, whether this is uh, focused on food transitions, on local transitions, on energy transitions, digital transitions, uh, accelerated transitions, etc. And so this might be very confusing, and actually it is. It has become. Maybe from a research perspective it is less so, but as this sort of lingo and, and these objectives entered society as political projects, uh, it's hard to disentangle the substance from uh, uh, the discourse. Uh, I've put here on this slide as well a uh, uh, picture of, uh, from the ministry, the former French Ministry of the Environment. This was in the margin of, of climate protests. Uh, the Ministry of Ecological and Solidary Transitions, so social and ecological transitions. And of course, someone uh, has uh, painted over this uh, uh, as a, I read this as a commentary on how the French government at the time was uh, trying to uh, govern this uh, in a very top-down cockpit and uh, <coughs> uh, technocratic way, uh, a process that uh, should be a democratic, distributed and participatory one. So the real, the question of whose transition are we talking about is a fundamental one for democracy, for justice and for uh, the eventual success of such uh, political and societal projects of change. Transitions is also a problem for the social sciences and humanities, and this is really uh, what I would like to convince you of as uh, students, uh, post, you know, uh, graduate students that might uh, uh, continue a career in uh, research. So within transition studies, we look at transitions and transformations as the central object of research. Okay, it's a phenomenon with particular attributes. There are multiple fields that have uh, been interested in these uh, big longitudinal processes, so transition studies I've mentioned. Integrated assessment modeling, for instance, looked as a, a very techno-economic perspective, future-oriented, uh, global macro perspective on, on transitions political and institutional uh, theory, historical sociology, of course, interested in sequences of, of change, of social change, the history of technology, this is very important for a socio-technical perspective, and science and technology studies, of course, as well. And the main question, the main research program here, is to understand and explain system change, how systems change over time, or how systems do not change over time, which I see as a flip side of the same question. And I've alluded to this already, transitions has become an object of politics and governance. Uh, so we see a multiplication out there in the social and discursive space of uh, uh, objectives of transitions, motives of transitions, claims of transitions. You know, we are driving from Brussels Transi energy transitions, for instance, or social movements claiming that they are uh, driving or con contributing to transitions. And with these claims come also different types of interventions. So how to support, sustain transitions. Uh, how to support transitions. How would we know that we are supporting these uh, uh, processes in the right direction? So that's a question for evaluation. And that's where, again, the knowledge, the research knowledge sort of comes in bites back the tail of, of, uh, of these issues. Within research, there is also a critical positioning, which I tend to adopt as well, uh, which is we're not just looking like physicists at phenomena out there. These phenomena are social and political 
and we are also, as scientists, embedded in some of these decision-making arenas, either as experts or as contributors. So uh, adopting a very critical perspective on these discourses, on the actors that are involved or not, on the power issues is fundamental. It's not just a natural science of transition and socio-technical change. It is really inherently a social and political one. And so we need to have the tools to address these. So if I go a bit further into the research program of this field, these are uh, uh, some of the fundamental issues, and you will recognize here some of the fundamental issues of most social science, of at least those interested in change. Uh, and here I've presented them as dualism. So the first one is how do we explain the inertia of socio-technical systems? So how do we explain that, for instance, a car-based transportation system is still prevalent and dominant in uh, most Western, or actually in most uh, urban uh, settings and peri-urban settings. How do we explain the various ways in which such systems may change? So that's really the big picture question of social science of stability versus change. When is it stable? When is it uh, changing? Is stability ever really a rigid form of stability or is it a dynamic, relational? form of stability. A second string of question, big picture question, how do socio-technical systems determine our ability to enact change? So this is the perspective of structural determinism. These structures, these systems are there and they constrain our action and we are pretty much prisoners of them. Not my fault if I have to take a car, it's the way the cities are planned uh, and I'm just a victim of this. And so uh, there's a sort of fatalism that can install it. The sort of flip side of this argument is do we have the capacity to transform the structures that condition our action? And this, for instance, a social movement perspective would claim that we do and will uh, suggest some ways to do so. Again, structural determinism versus agency is one of the big, big picture conundra of uh, social sciences. You know, you go to all the big thinkers have something to say and to contribute uh, to this. And uh, economy, economic science is not uh, immune to that. What uh, relevant entry points, if we're going to think about transitions, problematize them? So there's issues of scales, you know, because these unfold at different geographic scales, at different scales of, of governance. Uh, voilà. What levels, what spaces? Is a sectorial approach the right one, or should we look at multi-system transitions, etc.? And then a last one, which again uh, links to this question of social and political uh, uh, dynamics and the justice issues related. Are transitions empowering, or do they reproduce forms of inequality and injustice? And of course, the normative ideal would be that these transitions not only change the technical structure, and the socio-technical structure of society, but also allow peoples to, and communities to emancipate and address some of the fundamental vulnerabilities, you know, unequal access to energy, unequal access to health, etc. Also, uh, ideally, uh, transitions, a desirable transition is one that does not produce new forms of inequality. Let's say an electric, uh, electrification of transport leading to uh, significant injustices in mining communities where uh, cobalt, for instance, is being mined. So that's a central concern. So what does transition theory sort of uh, uh, suggest and come from? I see that the screen, uh, David, is not... Uh, I don't know, I must have done something. Uh, uh, if you want to... I don't know the scale of it, but I mean, it doesn't matter necessarily. Start again, okay. No. Hmm. No, it was working earlier, but. Well, never mind. I shouldn't have done it in widescreen. Okay. Fine, we'll adapt. Um, 
so the two main starting points for uh, looking at the world, for, well, for transition studies, the first ones I've alluded to this is the deep inertia of existing socio-technical configurations. Again, in food, energy, agriculture, there tends to be a dominant way in which these functions are organized. The infrastructure uh, uh, is optimized towards that. The rules are organized. The behaviors tend to accommodate or follow uh, uh, these uh, principles. The kinds of knowledge that we produce are feeding into uh, uh, these existing systems. So that's one. The second uh, uh, initial uh, starting point is that if we are to change these systems, the, uh, there is a limit to what you can do in terms of optimization or uh, adjustments. In most cases, what is really needed is a complete reconfiguration of these systems, and this is difficult. So, if transitions are fundamental transformations of production and con consumption systems, then there's a couple of ways that within this field we understand uh, uh, what is going on and what is to be looked at. Uh, we're talking about the co-evolution of three sort of sub-processes or mechanisms. New things emerge, new ideas, new devices, new uh, uh, ways to do things, uh, new ideals, new criteria, sustainability, low carbon, justice. Uh, new things, eventually, some new things and new ideas can stabilize and become generalized through institutionalization processes, through replication processes. And existing things might become destabilized, challenged in a way that is deeply existential in the sense, from a system perspective, in the sense that uh, the long-term continuation of things as they are is not assured. Crisis, potentially. Voila, so now I'll focus, I'll zoom in specifically on this process from now on of destabilization and how we can address this as a research problem. So again, in society out there, there are claims, there are discourses, there, there are motives, uh, there are political programs around uh, removing things, stopping things that are seen, seen as challenging, problematic. Uh, here, in the case of environmental problems, uh, well, health and environmental problems, there's a, a, a very long campaign in, in the beginning of the uh, 20th century, 1920s, 1930s, uh, uh, alerting about the health problems with uh, uh, lead uh, in water specifically, pointing to uh, the problem with lead in petrol. Uh, it took about 100 years to uh, remove, to get to an international convention on the removal of uh, lead with all countries in the world, excepting, uh, uh, I think it happened in 1921 when uh, Algeria finally joined. There are campaigns to keep fossil fuels in the ground. There have been campaigns in uh, largely uh, uh, Scandinavian and Germanic uh, countries about removing or stopping, halting nuclear energy. Uh, there is issues about uh, phasing out pesticides in agriculture, removing pesticides from agriculture. Uh, so these are perhaps uh, progressive campaigns, if you want. But we can remember also the 1920s prohibition where uh, there they, one of the claims was to remove, uh, um, let's say, behavioral uh, issues related to uh, drug and alcohol abuse, which you know, is, an, is another kind of motive to stop something. If we're looking at the destabilization, decline, discontinuation, or reduction of things, we might look at it at different levels. So I'm going to talk mostly about socio-technical systems, so the phase-out, the destabilization and phase-out of socio-technical systems. Think about a coal-based system, conventional farming, uh, uh, flying or for personal transportation, uh, whaling trade for all sorts of, uh, of, uh, of oily products and, and uh, voilà. ice trade for uh, preservation of food in the 19th century, slavery. We can focus on specific actors, so coal industry organizations, 
uh, coal lobbies, for instance, farmers unions, and they might have a particular interest in keeping things as they are. Uh, we can focus on particular substances. I've talked about uh, pesticides. Uh, uh, there are calls to stop certain plastic use, plastic bags. I will argue that this is not as challenging as <laughs> removing all petro-based uh, uh, plastics in society. Um, we can look at uh, the downfall or the destabilization of institutions. We can look at the uh, destabilization of knowledge regimes, particular kinds of knowledge under threat that might decline, that might end. Uh, uh, currently, there is a big issue in the air that modeling, economic modeling, uh, integrated assessment models are not uh, uh, providing uh, much <coughs> new knowledge uh, to uh, the question of transitions, uh, that most of what it's producing is known and that perhaps it doesn't need all the funding, all the infrastructure and all the research uh, that's put into it and that that might go somewhere else. So that's a knowledge production regime that is currently being challenged, being facing a, an existential mm -hmm. challenge. Is it destabilizing or declining? Not yet. Will it? I don't know. We can talk about specific events. Uh, so uh, crises is, is probably something that we've all, we've all become familiar with, uh, with COVID, uh, various financial cri uh, crashes, uh, in the 70s oil shocks, uh, industrial accidents, and uh, sort of the aftermath of that, and how do you deal with these crises. And of course, there's a question in comparative politics about the fall, the downfall of political regimes or entire civilization in, in history and archaeology. So all of this kind of, of knowledge is relevant. I'm not going to focus on that, but I'm just trying to show you how you know, these questions are deep questions for the social sciences. So now I'm going to try to illustrate how uh, ending a substance, so this uh, third row here, is different from ending an entire system, that scale matters. So if we look at DDT, so DDT was a very powerful uh, uh, kind of, uh, of pesticide. Uh, Rachel Carson uh, uh, was very strong advocate of uh, ending, uh, phasing out pesticides, and she was very successful in doing that. Her famous book, uh, uh, Silent Spring, uh, led to uh, political debates, uh, social mobilization, and eventually a ban of DDT first in the in a Scandinavian country, then in the US, and then a generalized ban with the Stockholm Con Convention. Uh, uh, so that happens between the 60s and the 80s. Extremely successful phase out of the substance. Has that had an impact on global use and production of pesticides? And has this impact been positive? I am not sure. Uh, there is a claim uh, that suggests that by one of the co-products of the ban on pesticides and the Stockholm Convention, which leads to uh, a, a sh much stronger regulation of these substances, has actually produced barriers to entry to this industry, making uh, chemical, f uh, pharma, uh, phytochemical uh, uh, companies playing in the pesticides game larger, more powerful, more able to lobby uh, governments and, and uh, uh, international conventions and indeed uh, global pesticide production and use has uh, grown uh, exponentially since the Stockholm Convention. So by rem one could almost suggest that by removing one substance we've actually made the system stronger. So the level and the scale at which these phase-outs and destabilize are targeted is critical for long-term uh, effects. Now the eggs. So I would like to argue that after 40 years of knowledge uh, about transitions, uh, specifically about transition pathways, how to bring about a transition uh, is no longer uh, rocket science. We know how to develop and support new things. We know how to support the development and growth of renewable energy. We know if we decide that 
The future of mobility is electric. We know how to support this with investments, with infrastructure, with uh, 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 working with uh, various types of actors to make this change happen. We're pretty good at, make, at this emergence, making new things happen. Uh, so with this uh, metaphor of the omelettes, I would like to say we're very good at making uh, omelettes. We can do a variety of different types of omelettes, French omelette, Japanese omelettes, rustic omelette, you know, and, and uh, we've all acquired a taste for these omelettes and, you know, it's, it's something that's, that's made its way uh, through society. But uh, I would argue that uh, what we have completely neglected, and this is one of the major hurdles we're facing right now as we want to accelerate certain transitions or actually make certain tra difficult transitions happen, is that we've avoided the difficult issues that, you know, you don't make an egg, uh, an omelette without breaking eggs. And a transition involves hardship, blood, sweat and tears, jobs lost. Uh, industries, organizations going bankrupt. Uh, it involves changing geopolitical uh, uh, balances. Uh, it involves new forms of vulnerabilities that are produced. And these have to be anticipated. If they're not anticipated, we end up in situations like we've had in France with the yellow vests or with the agricultural protests. We pretend this is not a social or political issue, that phasing out is not an, a matter, let's just support alternatives and regulate that, and we enter dead ends. So, I would argue it is essential, and it's, I mean, I hope to convince you to focus on destabilization, decline, and phase out. And so, the same way as we can make a number of omelets, I think there are many different ways we can break these eggs. We can make it so that the, you know, the egg doesn't spill over the floor, we can limit how, uh, you know, how messy this is. We can have a, 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 a sponge next to us to sort of at least avoid this. We can do it in a bowl. You know, we can, if we become interested in how we break these eggs to make these omelettes, uh, we will get better at cooking, at cooking in a tidy matter. And so similarly, as there are many uh, uh, emergence pathways, there might be many destabilization pathways. Some will lead to full decline of specific systems or industries, some to only partial declines, some to transformation, where the same actors sort of reconfigure to produce new things or different things, and also patterns of continuity, the destabilization that never happens is, uh, is essential to look at. Voila, so how will we look at destabilization? So I've proposed a way to uh, address this analytically, to sort of break down this pro pro uh, process so that we can follow it, trace it over time in cases, and then I'll illustrate this with a case. So two main questions. Under which conditions uh, may established systems decline, persist, or transform in the face of destabilization pressures? Well, uh, the second question, how may the phase-out of undesirable uh, systems be governed? So what kind of policies, what kinds of instruments, interventions, with whom, etc. I won't go into detail for now. I propose a definition of destabilization that implicitly has a number of ingredients, uh, implicitly has a model behind it and analytical dimensions that we should cater to, and I'll illustrate how we do this. So I define destabilization as a longitudinal process, process that folds unfolds over an extended period of time, by which otherwise stable social technical regimes become exposed to pressures that are significant enough to threaten their continued existence and their normal functioning. Okay, so under this, we're suggesting that there are socio technical regimes. These socio technical regimes tend to be dynamically stable. And there, there are particular conditions in which a single pressure or an ensemble of pressures might be significant enough to challenge, to make it, uh, to threaten the continued existence of this uh, uh, system or its normal functioning. I put this in brackets because what is normal functioning is a matter of asking the actors. 
uh, these processes tend to trigger two kinds, two broad kinds of, of, of responses, but of course there's a spectrum. Strategic responses from the central system actors, think for instance of a, a lobby that sits at the middle of the heart of a, of a system, for system preservation, okay, fighting back the pressures to maintain and ensure continuity, things as they are, interests as they have been, uh, uh, legacies, etc., or system transformation. Okay, and the whole point of the analysis of destabilization is to recognize different kinds of pressure, different kinds of pressure fronts that may themselves change over time, to recognize different responses, response strategies, their articulation over time as well, and changing commitment of core system actors to this normal functioning of uh, uh, regimes and systems as they are. For instance, a uh, petrol state will uh, uh, quite naturally want to preserve its rent on its you know, uh, natural resources and the pri past investments in capital. Uh, but perhaps under certain conditions, uh, system preservation will no longer work as a strategy, in which case they might start diversifying, seeking alternative opportunities first and then eventually completely disbanding. A second analytical uh, look, this is inherited really from a socio-technical perspective, is that we're going to look at three dimensions, a techno-economic dimension, so things, material, stuff, artifacts, devices, infrastructures, uh, economic flows, uh, money. We're going to look at institutional dimensions, so rules, uh, norms, values, beliefs, and we're going to look at relational dimensions, actors, networks, alliances, that themselves may in some periods be inherently stable, but may also, in a process of change, of transition, lead to disbanding of alliances. For instance, the regulation of uh, CFCs uh, by the Montreal uh, Protocol uh, uh, was uh, a political international policy deadlock for a long time until one of the big six, or were they seven, I can't remember, chemical companies, Dupont de Nemours, told the international regulators, no, actually we have substitutes. And then within months, the, prot the Montreal Protocol sort of accelerated. So that's Dupont Nemours disbanding from the prior alliance to keep things uh, and lobbies uh, stable. I just want to also remind that destabilization understood like this as a very open process with many different potential pathways, mechanisms, uh, is different from phase-out. Phase-out is the intentional governance intervention largely by policy actors to remove something and is different from decline. Decline of a system is something that we can measure uh, uh, probably more, more easily quantitatively while destabilization is obviously a more qualitative appreciative uh, issue. Combination of pressures, responses and changing commitments. <coughs> I'll illustrate a bit further uh, this distinction between techno-economic, institutional and relational aspects by focusing on uh, uh, what uh, technology is from a socio-technical perspective. So if we want to, uh, and, again, and, and I'll, I'll propose also four steps to analyze destabilization. The first one is to characterize the stability of the system. All the ingredients are here. Characterize the stability, stable socio-technical regimes. How do we know? We need to have tools to do that. Characterize the pr changing pressures and pressure fronts. Characterize the different responses and characterize the different types of commitment. So stability. So what's a stable uh, uh, socio-technical system? So I've here uh, put a picture of a car. Two cars, three cars, four cars, five cars. Okay. To me, this is not a car. To me, this is not a car-based system. Ceci n'est pas une automobile, okay? At best, it's an art installation, which actually it is, uh, in a workshop, 
and then installed in the public space. So why is it not a car? I mean, it's not providing mobility. There is no user. There is no infrastructure that allows, us to, allows it to, to work. We don't even know whether there's an engine in there. But it has all the other elements, the shape, form of the artifact. In order for it to be a car, a uh, socio-technical system, car, uh, a car-based socio-technical system is something that we can understand as a configuration of, that works, a configuration of very heterogeneous entities, material entities, institutional entities, actor entities, and that's going to help us uh, define in a given space and time what is the normal functioning of such a system. So here we have a white car there. That white car is driving, it's got lights on, it's got a driver presumably in it. Uh, it's, uh, drive, you know, it's on a road, so there's an infrastructure related to that. It's got neighboring cars very close to each other. It's quite a dangerous situation, right? I mean, you're zooming past at 50 kilometers an hour, two meters away from each other. That is a crazy idea. For that to have become normalized in society, the car has become domesticated through conventions, through a, a learning, teaching, apprenticeship, driver licenses, rules, regulations about the speed of, uh, of, of this, uh, safety regulations, safety devices, seat belts, etc. And suddenly we find each, each other sort of two, three meters apart in a situations that is no longer crazy because it's become domesticated. If you zoom back in the 1910s or 20s, this situation uh, was absolutely mad. And actually it, it led to uh, uh, the development of the modern car, led to a lot of social mobilization, one of the major ones being a child uh, death on the road. Because the roads were not made for the car, the car was not made for the road that wasn't there and the regulations configurations that have become functional over a long period of time and meaning that these have established very strong connection and this, the stability, the normal functioning of these systems, their heaviness, their hardness is a result of these long-term processes. So no doubt uh, it is uh, difficult to change. Not in the picture but essential for this to be a car, car-based system, are uh, petrol wars, uh, our geopolitics of oil, our investments in these, in, in these uh, uh, supply infrastructures, etc., etc. I won't dwell in that, you get the picture. So there are techno-economic components, rules and institutions, actors and social groups that contribute to stabilize, reproduce and maintain these uh, systems. That's why they're so hard to change. Pressures. So how do we propose to analyze pressures? So I want to suggest that on the same typology of three dimensions, techno-economic, rules, uh, institutional and relational, we can analyze different kinds of pressures that might bear on systems. So techno-economic kinds of pressures are uh, competitiveness issues, uh, demand issues that might challenge particular companies or industries, supply chain problems or even accidents, disruptive accidents, or even uh, yeah, accidents that lead to uh, uh, substantial problems, uh, death, etc., and need regulation or call for regulation. There are institutional pressures. Uh, the license to operate a particular uh, industry might be challenged. Uh, talk about, for instance, uh, fluke scam in, uh, in uh, Scandinavia. So the social uh, delegitimation of flying uh, issued from, well, emanating from uh, uh, social mobilization, but really turning, becoming a, a real social fact that is uh, troubling uh, the, the, um, the airline industry. Reputation problems, think about the Volkswagen uh, scandal, for instance, uh, when they cheated on uh, air pollution measurement devices uh, and also uh, led to uh, 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 substantial problems for Volkswagen owners. Uh, 
There might be regulatory constraints uh, uh, to regulate social problems that uh, uh, trouble uh, companies and industry. Uh, there might be relational uh, uh, pressures, so the changing alliances, the disbanding of alliances or the exit of particular actors from existing alliances. I've talked about Dupont de Nemours, but uh, we saw similar things when, for instance, Toyota went hybrid. It sort of shook up the uh, 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 car manufacturing industry by proposing a different kind of strategy. Then everyone followed, but for a while there was uh, pressure on the conventional. And there might be different pressure profiles. So uh, specifically, if we think about them in dynamic ways, so uh, there might be pressures that are very acute and very uh, radical and extreme, so shocks, talked about crises, for instance, or there might be much slower uh, stresses. Okay. Uh, pressures may vary in intensity and they may change over time. We have ups and downs with issues, for instance. And so the combination of different kinds of pressures and a different pressure profile might lead to completely different pressure fronts. And we need to understand these to know the situation in which we are concerning a particular system. Okay. So a shock or a crisis-led destabilization will look very differently from a slow burn uh, uh, destabilization pattern. We need to be able to analyze the responses. So uh, let's center just for ease on the, mm, the core, actor of, uh, core actors of a, of a socio-technical system, incumbent actors, so these powerful, resourceful actors that have vested interests in the current functioning and operation of regimes. So lobbies are a perfect example of this. They have much to lose from destabilization, so they will tend to favor a preservation logic unless destabilization, unless the pressures, the pressure fronts are significant enough to threaten their continued existence. They no longer have a choice. Okay. Responses may also vary over time. So when pressures are weak or when actors feel that they can deflect pressures, they will. They will deny, they will deflect, they will resist. But eventually, as pressure fronts evolve, they might take it more seriously, first by diversifying in, you know, hedging their bets, putting their eggs in different baske baskets, and eventually uh, uh, trying to uh, create new paths for their activities. Again, we can distinguish responses in terms of the three dimensions, techno-economic, institutional, and relational. So just some examples, uh, techno-economic responses by core industry actors, for instance, an innovation strategy, market positioning strategies. In terms of institutional uh, responses, of course, lobbying, trying to keep a seat at the table where the decisions are made in order to deny, to deny the problems or to resist regulation, for instance, uh, but there is also relational kinds of responses sticking together, forming alliances, okay, so as to be stronger together. So uh, closing quickly, the, to, sort of putting in uh, parenthesis, when under pressure, uh, uh, industries that uh, previously were hyper-competitive and maybe not that collaborative might suddenly become collaborative when they have a common interest in defending uh, alliances. And so commitments, that's probably the more difficult element, but a fun fundamental one, is that these systems are not stable in a static way. It's not just a snapshot and just, they need to be fed, they need to be reproduced, they need to be maintained, and that takes a lot of resources, a lot of work. Okay, systems are continu continuously reproduced, maintained, repaired when there are problems, when there, there are uh, accidents or, uh, 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 or other kinds of problems. So we need to look at the interruption or the reduction of commitments to these reproduction, maintenance and repair activities as a fundamental way to explain destabilization as well. 
So techno-economic ty type of, of, uh, of uh, commitments is, for instance, continuous investment in the maintenance of inf infrastructure. Okay. Uh, repairing defective or worn out uh, parts, which is a routine activity in any industry, a very costly one. Uh, resuming operations immediately after technical incidents. So we had a, 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 in France a rather difficult uh, summer, I think two years ago, uh, where uh, suddenly a large number of uh, nuclear power pr plants were, uh, uh, because the scheduling had been messed up, were being maintained at the same time. And suddenly it became very clear that this system is extremely vulnerable and that repair work is happening all the time. Institutional kind of repair is sitting in committees to legitimize, to reproduce and enforce rules, for instance, to make sure that you have a, 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 a say, a continuous say in a, a regulation. Uh, and relational kinds of commitments are keeping good ties, being good neighbors, being good, not competitors, but co-operators. Uh, uh, with, uh, within your field. Uh, well. Okay, so maybe there might be some question at this point for this very theoretical element, and then I'll go into the illustration that will clarify everything, hopefully. Uh, you use the term co-evolution. Mm -hmm. Is this, um, uh, like, do you share any uh, theoretical insights with the evolutionary uh, economics, or is it just Okay, very good question. Um, I should have shown something that I usually show, but I'll send it to you uh, uh, later on. Uh, we do a sort of a, a qualitative mapping of this field of transition studies, um, where we try to, to show how interdisciplinary it is. And, uh, and, and the two main foundational inspirations were indeed co-evolutionary economics and uh, STS. So STS is the study of science technology in society socio-technical interactions, co-evolutions, <coughs> uh, how users and designers uh, mutually shape the uh, uh, um, form and function of artifacts, for instance, uh, and co-evolutionary uh, thinking in uh, evolutionary economics, which has largely, for instance, with Giovanni Dossi, looked at uh, how uh, uh, rules, Commitment to uh, uh, ways of doing is, uh, is, uh, is determining dynamics within uh, industries and economic communities. What he calls techno-economic uh, paradigms. Uh, and there continue to be active ties uh, and actually researchers from transition studies that are inscribed in an evolutionary economics uh, paradigm. Dix minutes. Wow, 15, okay, I'm going to fly you through uh, trams. Okay, history, uh, historic dismantling of electric trams. Okay, just this picture to illustrate that uh, there's a generalized phenomenon. So this is the number, this is number of towns with active electric tramway systems in different countries. And you see, starting in the 1890s, the development of electric traction for tramways, so dominant becoming a dominant uh, form of public transport. And in most of these countries, uh, uh, you know, a pattern of decline, a uh, rather regular one. Uh, in green, uh, no, in red, I've, uh, I've pointed the total decline or near full decline. So uh, uh, Italy, France, uh, England, for instance, have completely dismantled their infrastructure after having built it up. And other countries like Austria, uh, uh, Sweden, uh, have partially uh, declined, uh, sort of halved their capacity. Okay, so different speeds, different durations, different patterns, but largely um, uh, homogenous. Uh, but how do we explain the rapid phase out, the particularly rapid phase out in France, the, the, the continuous line? So I'll rep I've reproduced here the continuous line for France. Uh, Forget about the renewal afterwards, as it's a completely different process. I shouldn't have done that, but I'm going to go through three periods and try to analyze these pressures 
responses and commitments in each period. First period is one of slowdown of the expansion and uh, slowdown of maintenance. The second period is one where we see increasing problems and weakening uh, commitments. And the last period is one of accelerated dismantling and closure. And what I would like to argue is that uh, the phase out uh, had already, the destabilization had completely happened. The decline was already done. The damage was done when the phase out announcement uh, uh, was made. This is to just to show you in 1921 at the peak what, uh, how extensive the tramway network was in Paris. So this you see Paris, the extent, uh, well, uh, so very predominant uh, network of mobility. The first period, uh, we have a number of pressures on techno-economic uh, fronts. So we have a, a very rapid diffusion of electric trams that led to a saturated ma market for network developers. Basically, they, they had built all the tram systems that, uh, uh, that they could. You know, uh, no longer were any cities in France that, didn't, that uh, didn't have, or major cities in France that didn't have a tram uh, uh, network. So the network builders basically were no longer interested. They went to hydroelectric uh, uh, dam development and, and things like that. There was a problem of financial viability for uh, the operators of smaller lines because there were multiple operators, a large number of lines operated by different operators. There was a growing ridership, so more and more users of the tram, but very poor maintenance and no renewal of the stock. So we had very outdated carriages okay, and not kept up. And there was a heterogeneous network, so many actors involved in operating tram systems, but there is, you know, no harmonized uh, design standards, no harmonized ticketing service, no harmonized, so very chaotic uh, uh, situation. The second problem is an institutional problem, is that uh, while electric traction allowed much greater speed and distance than the prior form of traction, steam or horse-drawn uh, uh, trams, uh, the rules had not changed. So speed of trams were still limited to uh, 20 kilometers an hour and the distances were regulated. So the potential, the technical potentials of tram was not accomplished and the rules were preventing that. And relationally, there was this uh, tram anarchy with uh, you know, multiple uh, operators uh, with conflicting ideas, conflicting uh, uh, investment plans and not the user was not central to this. The strategies is basically in that period that uh, networks continued to expand. So continued extensions of networks, no new networks, but extensions of networks. And a generalization of electrification. So we still had a bit of steam and a bit of horse run, but uh, 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 the, the, the main move during that period is a generalization of electrification. So that novelty, generalization, destabilization processes. Here we were fully in a generalization. Uh, setting. The uh, institutional strategies were to try to consolidate this, this chaos, okay? Because there were still eight horse-driven uh, tram lines in Paris, 12 steam, nine compressed air, uh, but this restructuration was failed because of the interruption of the war, okay? So they wanted to rapidly electrify, to finalize the electrification of the network, and they wanted to bundle operations together, and that didn't happen. Crisis, another kind of problem, a more, a less uh, uh, a preventable one, uh, interrupted a program that was supposed to bring some solutions and some coherence. Relationally, uh, some actors started to shift away from trams. General Electric, for instance, which was a dominant player in uh, the development of tram networks in Paris, just was no longer interested, okay? Uh, and still we had this fragmented ownership of tram lines which made it chaotic and, and difficult, uh, uncoordinated in a way. In terms of commitments, you see very clearly declining investment in maintenance and renewal of stock, okay? So this active work and investment that is necessary to maintain something stable and keep it up was not done, okay? Institutionally, uh, there was a clear commitment to electric tra traction, so that was positive. Uh, but there was also a concession regime, the way they attributed the uh, uh, operations, that was not responsive to the tremendous demographic explosion in Paris at that time. Yeah. Uh, uh, a huge development of peri-urban Paris, notably in, in the north, what is now the 20th and La Colline and Romainville, exploding slums, basically. 
okay, needing social measures and public transportation. Relationally, electric companies, I mentioned that already, retreated from the trend. Now entering the next uh, period, pressures. So technical pressures in that period from the 20s, uh, it, during the 20s, is the beginning of substitution with motor buses. So buses, as we know them, you know, diesel traction, or petrol traction. Uh, uh, first demonstrated in, the 20, in 26, you know, on one, two lines, then got you know, the favors of a number of decision makers and investors. This became, in a way, a self-fulfilling prophecy because motor buses would turn out to enable the phase-out of the tram because there was a clear substitute, but also the development of motor buses required the phase-out of the tram. Okay? There were institutional problems. Uh, specifically, I'll just point to the problem of congestion, which is clearly in illustrated in the picture uh, here. So, you know, these uh, sort of wonky trams, cumbersome trams at crossings that were not suited and not well designed, uh, that, that created a real problem. They also removed the first class, uh, it used to have first and second class, they removed that, so the tram became quite clearly a purely working class uh, 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 mode of transport. That shouldn't be necessarily a problem, but it meant that a particular kind of ridership was no longer in favor or supporting uh, this uh, mode. In terms of strategies, uh, we see a move, sort of a, well, a, a necessary move towards standardization. So they developed what was, became called the L train, and the idea was to generalize this so as to have more harmonized uh, technical functioning. They uh, started uh, uh, renovating uh, uh, the really the poorest tram tracks, as well as amalgamating. Uh, I'll show you this later, but basically there were interrupted connections in Châtelet. In Châtelet or in the République, you had to stop off to go from east to west of the city. By amalgamating, they created further continuity, so much more relevant logistically networks. In terms of institutional strategy, the main program was of restructuring, okay, bundling operations under single over ownership of the Department of the Seine uh, with a very clear established a uh, new public duty, public operation objective. So the idea was a tram is a public good. We need to keep uh, uh, this uh, running. We need to invest in it. And that means also at the cost of maintaining investments on unprofitable lines, in theory. I'm putting here in theory because in practice, obviously, this commitment was not uh, fulfilled and that, that led to uh, contribute to the drama. Relational strategy, so there were conflict between the main operator, now that had all the operations bundled, the STCRP, and the local authorities. It was the duty of local authorities to provide the public money for the SCRTP, but they didn't, and so that led to conflicts, and so this public transport duty, in principle, will not be uh, fulfilled. So here, uh, yeah, illustrating just how the bundling of operations provided much more continuity between, uh, uh, just in two years, they basically connected and plugged uh, discontinuous systems together. Much more fluid tram system. In terms of commitments, uh, there was a plan for express tramways, so that was, you know, uh, serving the equivalent of today's RER, but that was abandoned, uh, and pretty much from 1926, investments just stop. And that coincides with the development of the first motor buses. Okay? And in terms of uh, 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 commitments, a new idea of freeing roads from the tram emerged. That was very contested, but it did emerge. Okay? I would say perhaps the most critical element is the lack of institutional commitments to this public transport duty and to continued investment. So there was no real constituency actor, organized actor or coordinated uh, uh, actors uh, there to fight against the pressures, to fight for accessible public transport, for the right for, to transport. Uh, and uh, at the same time, there was uh, a closure, experimental closures of lines and no one really resisted this. 
So this leads me to the last period, but I don't have much to say, well, I'll skip quickly through this last period. This basi basically from 1929, uh, there was an institutionalization of a dismantling program, a phase-out program, you know, sanctioned by local authorities. And the phase-out rate is extremely impre uh, impressive. We, we compare now this to what we're trying to do in the coal industry or in other, this is just 20 line closures per year. It's, it's absolutely massive. Mm -hmm. So that sort of tells us in a way as well, when there's a will, when there's the right conditions, phase-out is not impossible. And the rates are, can be impressive. Here again, to illustrate the sort of speed uh, so a very stable system still is still in the tw tw 20s and 30s and from, from 1933 the whole tram system vanishes within four years. Okay. Extremely impressive. So in conclusion for this case, and then I'll see with David how much uh, he allows me, uh, uh, how much more time he gives me, uh, we have a long-term destabilization pressure, uh, uh, process uh, multiple pressures on different fronts in different dimensions, very poorly adapted response strategies, no actors fighting back, a l some lack of luck, you know, the interruption by the First World War was significant in uh, uh, not modernizing the system as it could have, uh, and reduced commitments, no one fighting back. Uh, okay, and that considerably weakened the system. So when someone proposed in 1929 we should experiment on phasing out trams. There was just no one to resist this idea. Okay? Tramways were, and really claim, were already dead okay, from the inside. So when we're looking, for instance, today at, uh, in the coal or fossil fuel uh, arena, at uh, the formation of the powering past coal alliance uh, with pledges from countries in particular places in the world uh, to uh, phase out entirely coal from their power generation and from their industry. A colleague at Chalmers University, Jessica Jewell, has looked from an economic, techno-economic perspective as what is the <laughs> sort of investment and industry structure of these countries that are claiming to be powering past coal. An overwhelming majority of these countries had already structurally retreated from coal. Their power plants were already past their maturity. Investments have been stopped. There was no significant coal lobby, lobby in, uh, nationally. Uh, there was, uh, voila, so perfect conditions. So in a way, these pledges which could be seen on the international scene as heroic pledges, are just, you know, a discursive manifestation of something that has already happened. Okay? Okay? So beware of claims of phase-out and understand that, you know, there are structural uh, conditions required uh, uh, for this kind of um, uh, claims. Do I have five more minutes to do further examples and a conclusion? Okay, cool. So I'll just run through, just, just to open beyond trams and beyond uh, some of the uh, examples I've alluded to, to see how you know, we can look at different patterns in different places. And, 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 and the really the idea, again, uh, the different ways to break the eggs. You know, the idea is to look at different destabilization pathways. They're not all going to be the same. This one, the tram one, was a, a very extreme one, very rapid, uh, full decline under conditions of, of long-standing weakened commitment and no fight back, okay? Okay, so this we've seen, yeah? Uh, when it was phased out, when the decision was made, the tramways were already dead. If I look at coal in the UK, something I've worked on uh, 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 10 years ago, uh, um, we have a particularly politicized process of ending coal. It was not a full decline at that time, it was a partial one, but it was a significant uh, uh, war. Uh, Margaret Thatcher phrased, framed it as a war. Uh, she talked about the enemy within, a war between government, neoliberal policies uh, and agendas, and outdated miners clinging on to an old 
world. Uh, nonetheless, uh, this highly politicized phase out was very rapid. Okay, so we can ask ourselves, is an accelerated or a very rapid phase out, is that only achievable under highly tense political conditions with considerable social outcomes that are still lasting today? No? Brexit is not uh, foreign to this situation. Okay. So if that's, you know, if that's the outcome, if that's the option, maybe it's not the best uh, option. Huh? Or maybe we need to develop sort of the ability to anticipate and to soften the cushion of these, uh, 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 the outcomes of accelerated uh, coal decline. Comparing the very rapid uh, uh, British coal decline to, for instance, the German or the Dutch uh, coal decline, much longer in time, Okay, but with conciliatory measures, uh, some participation, round tables with the different actors, and in the end, a less uh, socially damaging outcome. I've alluded to this. Okay, this is really to, to, to show and to remind you that, you know, phasing out a thing, a substance, an artifact, a practice, a behavior is different from phasing out or discontinuing an entire system. Okay. I'll quick skip the nuclear one. I'll just uh, leave you to the beef in France. This is my butcher here, uh, Olivier Granier. Uh, so we have, uh, in a way, a perfect destabilization setting. Very strong pressures, health pressures, environmental problems, ethical concerns, economic, structural economic crises of the uh, farming uh, industry uh, in France, as well as the, f uh, the meat retail industry. Still, the trends are barely moving. Okay? There's a slight shift from beef to other leaner forms of, of, of meat, but you know, it's a relatively stable system. Why is that and how? Well, a couple of things that we have observed is that there have been strong responses so you can't look at just at the pressures alone. Mm -hmm. There have been strong re uh, responses, a restructuring of the industry with amalgamation of interest and you know, a couple of powerful uh, actors sort of uh, 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 leading this industry. Charal is owned by, you know, who owns the abattoir, who owns the uh, concentration of equipment and also an active strategies to reframe what meat is, what beef is from the industry itself. So, of course, it makes sense to go look at one of these core uh, uh, system actors, Interbev, the Interprofession Association for Beef Industry. So that's the beef producers, the beef distributors, the abattoirs, the uh, 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 butchers are represented in there. Their campaign three years ago, naturally flexitarian, okay? So that's meat. Meat is no longer meat. Meat is a flexitarian option within a flexitarian diet, right? Okay, very crafty. And of course, they do much more than that. A uh, last uh, uh, point here about the uh, wine uh, scandal in Austria, just to give you a little bit more hope. Uh, so there was in the 80s, uh, uh, so before the 80s, uh, Austrian wine was pretty basic, pretty bad quality. Uh, sold in two liter bottles, nothing, uh, not much marketing efforts, not much, you know, uh, recognition internationally or nationally. The Germans liked it. They liked the sweet wine, the sweet Austrian wine. And that sweet Austrian wine required particular uh, conditions, really hot summers, okay? Uh, and the uh, German buyers became uh, connected with the Austrian producers. The Austrian producers became dependent on this relationship with the German buyers, so much so that a couple of bad summers produced a situation where uh, uh, not enough sweetness, not enough sugar in the wine, but contracts to fulfill, you know, pre-purchase by the German board. So what do we do? 
and of course this practice had been experimented with it uh, with a couple of years before but basically they put di diethylene glyco uh, in the wine which is antifreeze or similar to what you know what you put in your car uh, that uh, poisoned a number of people, could have killed, apparently there is no death attributed to that, anyway led to a massive scandal of national, international proportions and the usual, while the usual reaction, response to a major crisis is put it under the carpet, don't worry, we're crisis management, managing, nothing to see here and just close this parenthesis to reopen it later, here exceptionally what the Austrians did is that they put a moratorium on wine production, they completely transformed the way the vineyards were uh, 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 structured, they set up a marketing, uh, wine marketing board, they set up a wine law that then was adopted throughout uh, Europe, and they created, uh, you know, really a phoenix from, from its ashes. They transformed Austrian wine from something ordinary and of no real value uh, to, uh, you know, an industrial, uh, an, international export, high quality uh, product. So crisis can, uh, uh, crisis induced destabilization can also in certain circumstances lead to positive transformations. And so just to conclude, I would like, I would hope that you understood that we can look at destabilization as a, com a, a combination of pressure fronts, response strategies and commitments and that we can study this over time that there is variations in speed, so with very rapid and total decline uh, in, in the case of trams, okay? And that conditions, favorable conditions are essential, okay? And more generally, in terms of transitions, uh, I would like to affirm that transitions involve making things the omelettes, okay, we know how to do it, we're getting better, we know, but also breaking things, okay, and uh, uh, this is essential, you know, we have no chance of uh, 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 instilling any positive transformative change in the world if we're not facing and anticipating these issues. This problem has become a research object, it's still uh, marginal, but it's become a research object, it's become a governance object, claims of phase out. And uh, it's fruitful to look at pathways, varieties of different ways destabilization and phase out can happen, and to think in terms of typologies, fast, slow, political, un lesser political, just, unjust kinds of destabilization and decline. Voila, sorry for being too long. Thank you.